All right, everybody, welcome back. Instructor Phil Dimitratis here. Today, we're going to talk about texture. So last week, this whole class, we've been talking about shape and form. We talked about uh, basic core primitive shapes in the very beginning of class. We talked about wrapping those shapes with rubber bands. We talked about additive and subtractive methods of drawing. We just talked about organics. I showed you three different approaches to creating organics. The, what we've basically been doing is we have been covering everything that deals with the basics of form, okay, when, and how form turns and how it's related to us inside the world of perspective, okay, which is what we see and how we mimic that and place that on paper. The next step and what we're going to do is we need to start talking about texture, okay, and some of you, unfortunately, have had a basic drawing class before, and all you covered was like cross hatching, maybe stippling if you were lucky, and that was it, right? Was that was there anything else? And that's one of the things that that makes me insane is that oh my god, there are so many textures you have to get under your belt. So we're gonna have a couple different assignments now, and what we have to do is we need to really stop and think about surface texture. What are the textures on objects? Because what we're going to do, I'll do this in a part two drawing demo, is I'm going to start to draw objects. Then I'm going to start to wrap texture around the outside of the objects, indicating the contour line and the shape and the form. Okay. Now, I was mentioning this to somebody earlier today, and this isn't a bad thing. Some of you come from illustration backgrounds and you get hooked into rendering. Rendering is bad. Why? Because if you get hooked into rendering and you don't understand form, you can render the heck out of something and you're still going to have something that doesn't look correct. You have to have shape and form has to exist. Okay, so this is what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be moving on to texture. And I'm going to have you guys start to create some really basic texture swabs like this. And I'll have you start to look at a bunch of different textures. Okay, we're going to create a minimum right now of 10 of these. Okay, so you're going to take a page and you could probably do five on one column, five on another, and that'll be 10. And then when we're done, we're going to do gradients of these textures because I want you to get a good understanding. Now, those of you might think of stipple, stippling, like little dots, that is a form of a basic gradient texture. Okay, but look at these patterns as well. When we start talking about breaking stuff down into various patterns, and if you start looking close up at nature, okay? So, for example, if you were to take a look at the shell of a turtle, okay? Or if you were to take a look at, for example, let's go through some of these textures and think about where you would find these inside nature. Where would you find that guy right there? On a turtle, maybe spots on a giraffe, somebody mentioned, right? What about, can you think of an object that might have that sort of rumpy, that looks like like a, a, a round sort of bumpy subject matter, right? Okay, what about this right here, or this, these scales? Fish. What about rattlesnakes, right? Reptiles. Okay, see where we're going with this? Okay. What about, this one's a little bit harder, what about something like this with the squiggly lines on it? It could be like a form of fur, right? Also, you might notice you might have something with squiggly lines on that when we have anything that's round that's made by nature, like seashells. Um, anything that has rind, round spirals in it tends to have little spiral textures sort of built inside it, okay? What about something like that? That sort of graph pattern that's right there. Lizard. Yeah, possible like a, a lizard texture. There are some reptiles that don't have the scales, but like sort of a rough skin. Uh, a, a, another reptile example would be alligator. Ever seen alligator skin? Okay. It has that sort of, it's not quite scale, but it's sort of more of a squared sort of texture path, okay? All right, so if you start going through, I want you to start think of different animals. What about if I said, if I was drawing a dragon and I'm thinking of the neck of the dragon right under the base of the chin, I might point at this type of scales right here. Do you see that? These scales are a little bit more elongated and a little bit more rectangular versus these scales are more round, okay? What about something like that, like little angled shards? 
Okay, it looks like broken glass, but where might I see a texture like that on something that's sort of rough like that? And remember, some textures could be man-made textures, okay? What if I had some type of a grip? It was like on my, on, if you go, any of you guys skate, okay? You have your basic uh, grip paper that you put up on top of there. It's like a sandpaper with glue on it, right? I've seen different grips that have patterns like this. I've seen motorcycle gloves, okay, that have patterns on the index fingers. So when you, you're riding your bike, you can hold on, and it gives you a little bit of a grip. Um, I'm going to call grippage, okay, the act of gripping, right? So you have a little bit more grip wrapping your hands around something, or if you reach up and your fingers grab that clutch bar or the brake bar, those little pads add a little bit more, okay? I've noticed this type of, of uh, texture also on man-made like elements. For example, like I've seen phone cases that have texture on the back of it, so it prevents them from sliding if you're in your car, okay? So when it's, we go through these textures, this is what I want you guys to start to do, is I want you to start to think about different patterns and texture and how you can create these, okay? Now, to be honest, if you start thinking about everything as man-made materials or, or man-made objects, it's a little bit harder. With texturing, one of the secrets is going into nature. You have to really take a look at nature and it'll give you a better idea. So when you start taking a look at some of these, look at this, look at what is listed here. I'll put this up on the blog for you, by the way. Merging and radiating lines, that's fantastic. We have lines that go from a piece, from a center point, and they radiate out. So where are you likely to find something like that on? Wood. On a piece of wood, exactly, right? And we already, here's loops and scales variant, right? Here's another loop and scale that's a little bit larger. Look at these. This is loop and scales, but it's a different variation. They start from a smaller pattern, and they get larger as they recede outward, okay? What about over here? Look at this. Look at how awesome that is. It's a little bit harder, takes a little bit more time. Circles and bubbles, little bubbles next to each other, right? Gives you a nice gradient feel. If you looked really close at an orange, you might find that type of surface texture on there, okay? What about this right here, dots and variations? Now that to me is a really cool approach to stipple, okay? But lot dots with spaces in between them, not over, not touching each other. That's going to give you a nice little pattern. The reason why we need to start thinking about these, look at this, merging lines. You'd see that on a feather. You might see that on hair. Is we can start coming down and writing different uses for each one of these textures and how they apply. Okay? And there is no, no per se, law, whatever your little brains can think of. I go into spirals. Start thinking about large against small. Start thinking about contrasting shapes. Okay, think about variations in shapes. Maybe, maybe a, a, a texture adjustment or texture swatch of circles and triangles all together, but going from dark to light. Maybe they're in size variant. Okay, the reason why we want to start to do this is I want I need to get you guys familiar with thinking about uh, different surface textures that are applying to different uh, things that you take for granted that you see every day. Wood leather, rock, the bottom of your shoe, okay? The texture of polyester versus the texture of, of a leather jacket versus the texture of cotton, okay? What about, have you guys ever seen a stitched cotton shirt from like Sri Lanka that's very like thick patterns of very thickly weaved cotton? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, versus have you ever seen different variants in polyester? Polyester is a man-made material made out of oil, okay? I, I love to do, whenever I go hiking and motorcycle riding or bike riding, right? I have a lot of North Face equipment because it keeps me warm. So I have, there are lots of different surface textures. Some of the polyester blends are very smooth. Some are very rough and they retain warmth better, okay? Those types of texture elements are going to be really, really important as we move forward here, okay? All right, so... How do I get textures? I always get this with students. I can't think of any textures. I don't know what to do. And they start complaining about stuff, right? Well, guess what? Luckily, thanks to the wonderful world of the internet, you can just come along and you can just type in texture swatches. And there are tons that came up. I just did this really quick. Look, brick wall patterns and texture. Okay? 
where would you be likely to see that? Maybe on an old house that has some type of, of old paneling and, and labeled, or um, uh, I was going to say um, stone that are going inside a wall. What about as flooring element? You could see something like that, right? Okay, start thinking about texture variants and how these textures work. Look at that texture right there. Look at how beautiful that is. You see that? All those little grains and little crackles in there. How do you replicate that onto paper? How do you draw that? Okay, I'll give you one little secret about textures right now, and I'll mention this on the blog for you. This is how I create textures in Photoshop. It's something I always think about. Textures have high points and low points. You have contrast areas that are dark that drop down, and then you have highlighted areas that pop up. When you put those two areas together, you're going to get a little canal like this. You're going to get areas with white highlights that pop up, and then you get areas of darks that sink down. That right there is the secret to textures. So if you start looking around at textures, you have a white area, okay? And then you have this little dark line in there. So anywhere we go, here's another pattern texture that somebody created, okay? That's a, you know, a... Now, some, someone could look at that and be like, oh, that looks like it's some type of a, of, a, of a snake skin, okay? If I had lots of spare time, I would love to collect textures of dead animals. Not that I'm freaky or anything. It's just that I think it'd be cool to really examine what are the difference in scales. For example, what about us living here in California, right? We have rattlesnakes. But there are different rattlesnakes here than there are up in perhaps Washington or in other parts of, I, rattlesnakes look, can look different. There's a diamondback rattlesnake. Anyone know of any other type of rattlesnakes? Okay, well, I'm sure there, there's a ton of different rattlesnakes, okay? But if you were to look, I, I've been to Arizona and seen rattlesnakes that, that are darker, that are more red, that, that blend in their environment different. I've seen California snakes where I live in the back hills, okay, of Yorba Linda and Chino, there are tons of snakes out there, and they're like a light brown, okay? They have different scales. They have different shaped heads, okay? All those elements come together. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let me jump back up here, okay? So look at that. Look at how awesome that is. Wood blocks, little pieces of wood raised to different heights. Now, that might be hard to draw, but you need to think about how could I produce that. Diff different types of stone, okay? What happens if we have something that's round? Where would you use that texture? On house, on house roofing, that's right. Okay. What about shields? Would you use that on a shield? I've seen old armament from Asia and Asian empires where they would use round clay tiles on, on the front of wood as shields to block as a first defense to knock away arrows or to... Or to, to prevent a sword blade from penetrating part of the base wood that they have wrapped around their arm, okay? What about when we get into the world of rock and we start looking about what about all the variation of rock? There's lead stone, okay, which is different. There's sandstone. You have, anyone else can think of any other types of rocks out there? Limestone, Limestone right? Granite. You know, granite comes in different forms. Sometimes we see granite polished when we see it on a countertop. When I go up to Sequoia National Park in California, they have, we go to the, I take my kids, there's this one part that has natural granite slides. And you can walk up the granite because the granite is a rough texture that's like sandpaper and your feet can walk right up it. But when it's wet, it's incredibly slippy, slippery. Okay, so... Granite would be a great example, looking at the variations, okay? What about textures that are created by man? What about woven textures, okay? All right? What about scratch textures? Different types of stone. That is an alabaster-based, um, what do you call that? What's the name for it? It's a very, very soft stone. Um, travertine. Which is almost like an alabaster-based product. Travertine's very soft, and it has these little milks and crannies in it, okay? On a scale of 0 to 10, 
okay, marble and some granites are very hard, okay, stones. There's a difference in the feel of the texture that you see, these little pitted areas that come through. What about wood bark, okay? What about this? What about nature? What about simple water drops that are in front of you, right? If you can't think of 10 textures, there's something wrong with you. It'd be pretty easy to do that, okay? Shouldn't be too complex. All right. What I want you to do here, I'm going to show you some samples here. Why is this important? Because when we get to a world of drawing and the sketching and we take shape and form and we start sketching in our sketchbooks, we have to have the ability to use line to correctly wrap shapes and forms, but the texture pattern that we apply on top of our linear form drawing is going to have a dedicated read to the viewer. And if we change those patterns accordingly, and if we do it right, we end up with a very successful drawing. Okay. Now, there's something in, in drawing, I mention, give you guys this, this metaphor all the time with form. It's like baking a cake. To bake a cake, we bake the structure first. Once the structure is done, and we have the foundation, which is the form, we then, when we bake a cake, what's next? We then come on, we put the frosting on it. When the frosting's done, we keep narrowing down the detail on the cake, right? We get to the point where we're doing like the little flowers, little pieces of chocolate, little teeny details where you write a name. That's how we bake the cake. But without the structure underneath, the cake falls apart. Okay, it's the same principle in drawing. If we come in, we start taking a look. Oops, I didn't mean to jump ahead there. If we come in and we start taking a look, look at the texture variant here with the trees and the bushes. Look at the texture variant that's happening here with these sort of rounded lines and little like tile looking indications. Look at, look at the wall. The wall is like the side of the pencil pressing down that gives you that sort of plaster feel. Okay, as we scroll up here and look at here, we have sort of that plaster feel again. Okay, and as we come up to the top here, we have little even shadows in the way that they are represented in terms of a texture, not just one big mass of shadows. Sometimes it could be a series of lines really close to each other, overlapping each other that indicate some form of detail. Okay, so when you start looking at people that have a, a really solid understanding of how to draw and how to design, there's a point in when we start to apply textures over shape and form that we really have a good understanding of different variants that we can apply, okay? Because we can have rock patterns and textures and understanding the breaking points, understanding how the thick and thin contour line is wrapping over a texture, okay? And we get into different types of grasses, okay, grass and rock. We have short grass, we have long grass. Could that be a pattern or a texture? Absolutely. Okay. What about fur? What's the difference between a poodle fur and pug fur? Two different types of textures right there. Poodle fur has little curls in it, right? Okay. Pugs are like little short, you know, I have pugs, that's why I know that. I have short hair versus, oh, I used to have a German Shepherd. There's a really, you know, big beefy dog with tons of hair. Gets all like this little, like little mane on it. It's like a little lion, right? Clumps of hair that comes off in the summertime, right? So that's important because as we move through and understanding shape and form and how to correctly display it, we really have to have a good sense of patterning and understand that these patterns or what we call textures or what I even call surface content, okay? So when we get into digital painting and we get into advanced level of drawing, we have to really start thinking about what is the surface content of the different objects that we are looking at, okay? And this isn't something new, by the way, that's being taught to just you guys, okay? This is something that has existed. The American illustrators, the great masters, they had to go through this and they had to learn different variants and textures, okay, and how to apply that. Um, look at this, for example. Look, look at this wonderful example here. The sketch look at the brick texture that's up here we get these sort of like little hatched lines that are going in one direction okay um, there's a difference in the texture between here 
in the open areas. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic little drawing because there's a lot happening there in terms of overall texture and shape, okay? What about when we start looking at different types of exterior environments that are created by nature, rock formations. Rocks are great. There's so many different types of rocks, there really are, okay? And there's so many variants that happen in all those different types, okay? I mean, there's so much to look at. You can look at California terrain. You can look at Utah terrain. I mean, all you got to do is go to Google and type something in, boom, it's there, and sit and start to sketch it and start to imagine what that texture is and how it's working, okay? If you start to learn to apply this into part of your sketching and your drawing, you'll become very proficient at drawing correctly and making things look realistic, okay? But you have to have that understanding of how do I make a wall texture versus a brick texture versus metal texture versus a man man-made object texture. Okay, there's four or five different textures that go into each drawing that start to bring it alive. Okay. All right. Let's go over here. And did I skip over? Yeah, I wanted to show you. So one of our wonderful instructors here, Mike Sheehan, who's an amazing artist, right? I want you to see when Mike's drawing in his sketchbook, you can see the variance of textures that are going in there and how he's using the line. Is anyone in here out of class with Mike Sheehan? Teaches a couple classes here for us, okay? Really talented guy. Always out in his sketchbook, constantly. So he understands and probably has pages. In fact, a lot of the artists I know that go out and draw and people that I go sketch with, when they're bored, they sit around and they came up, they come up with really cool texture ideas. They just sit down and they draw a little graph and they start drawing a texture in there. Okay? And that's sort of what we're going to start to do for this week. Okay? We're going to we're going to map out little texture squares and then we're also going to do texture gradients to understand how that texture applies going from a dark to a light. Okay? Look at the texture on this. Okay? Look at the lines here. Look at the ruffled pattern here. The lines here going in opposite direction. It's really, really important to understand how to do some of this, okay? It gives you a good idea what's the difference between bushes, what's the difference between, you know, a uh, wall and roof, what direction are the lines going, when you get into cross hatching, when do you when do you not, okay? Being able to sketch like this, this is a, a huge part of what we do. Some people call it rapid visualization. Some people call it dynamic sketching, okay? Some people just call it plain old sketching and drawing, okay? A huge part of what we have to do is be able to communicate to a viewer what something looks like. In order to do that, we need to know shape and form, and we have to have an understanding of texture variance. If I zoom into this drawing a little bit, look at the texture on the wall here. There are a series of five lines, five to six, maybe seven lines, but they're going like this. They're being off pattern. They're going into different directions. So if I zoom in a little bit more, and if you can see it, I know it gets a little bit blurry. Look, there's like five lines like this. One, two, three, four, five going this way. And then another set. One, two, three, four, five. And then they rotate a little bit. They go a little bit more to the left. One, two, three, four, five. These are tilted a little bit more. These are more straight. These are horizontal. These ones turn over here. By putting all those together, you now create a wonderful pattern of what that wall or the plaster might look like. Okay? Now... What was the first little golden secret I told you about textures a couple minutes ago? All textures have what? All textures have a high point and a low point. They have an area of like contrast and they get little dark areas where they ditch down. Okay. I'm going to call that high, high point and low point. So you think about that when you're drawing. That's how you get textures to pop. I'm going to give you another little, another little hint, another little piece of secret advice that only comes from lots of drawing and lots of practice, okay? This is why renderers suck at rendering, because they don't know this. You have to have areas of contrast, meaning that you, if you have an area of texture, you have a white space next to it. Why? It makes the texture pop. What happens if you have texture next to texture? They, they, that's right. They compete against each other, and it flattened down part of the drawing. So when you're drawing in your sketchbook, and you're sketching a rock or a plant or a tree, you need to always go back and think about the second thing that Phil told you about. Outside of the texture itself, 
when you're placing textures next to other items, you have to have an area of openness. So if I come in here, notice the texture, the openness. A couple indications of rock. Okay, that's one of the that's one of the next things that we're going to talk about. I'm going to write this down in the blog for you. That's what I call su suggestive detail. Okay, but let me go back though real quick to contrast and openness and that variation. Okay, so if I come back here and we start to look at you know an area of of texture and then openness, right? That's going to be really important. An area of texture, an area of openness, an area of texture, an area of openness. Okay. If we start to incorporate that into part of our drawings, it makes things work a lot easier. Even if we get into ink washes, okay, you might have uh, an area of detail, and then you have an area of sort of lacking detail. Okay, that's how it works in overall drawing. So if you come in and start taking a look, this is where we start getting into some really cool rendering styles. Right, we get lots of detail and then an area of rest. Okay, that's basic contrast. That is Composition 101 right there. That's one of the important tools of composition, is knowing when to let go of the texturing and then when to bring it back, okay? Really, really important. So as I keep going through some of these drawings here, and you'll start to notice area of detail, area of rest. See it? Okay? Area of detail, and then it, contrast. Okay, it's a simple contrast, okay? Now, the importance of suggestive detail is... Instead of going in and detailing up the whole entire sidewall of something, all we really need to do is put a couple of little indications of what's happening with the line, and then our brain fills in the rest of that. Okay? There's a, there's a particular theory for that. Now here, I just grabbed this. This is someone's sketchbook. One of my problems with this is look at how freaking busy it gets in here. Do you see that? It gets so busy, it starts to become flattened. Why do drawings become flattened? Because there's too much detail and there's no opposites. There's no contrast of dark against light. Here, it starts to read. We get an area of dark with an area of light. We get an area of detail against an area of light. Here, detail, detail, detail gets to be too much. Okay. So when we come back and we look at like a sketch from Mike Sheehan, you'll start to notice an area of detail against an area of white. You'll notice an open area against an area of detail. Okay, you're going to start to notice that in part of the drawings and the sketches that are taking place. And then if I go back and we take a look back at the rocks again. Let me pull up the rocks really quick, right? Some of the more successful drawings, you will now start to notice an area of what? Detail and texture against an area of whiteness. So you can use the white and the, and the lacking area of detail to actually indicate that maybe that's the direction of light coming through. You can do either or. That can end up being an indication the light's coming this way because now the texture ends up becoming an area of shadow. That's what we'll talk about later. That's our next section. Pretty soon we'll start talking about light and shadow and how we indicate that onto a surface form with texture. Okay. All right. But before we get to that, okay, took a look at Mike there. All right. Um, what did I put in here? This is the importance of, let's come back here. Let's take a look. At drawing other organics, okay? So when we come through here and we take a look at when artists are sketching fish and when they're sketching bugs, okay? Look at the texture variance. Look at the little dots on here, okay? Look at the different lines that are on here. You have to have the ability to look and understand, like if you look close at a fish, they have little parts of like dots that are closer by the eyes. In fact, I notice when I sketch characters, the human face tends to have, most people tend to have little light freckles and little bits of dots around their eyes and underneath their eyes, and then it fades off, and then you get to the tip of the nose. The tip of the nose tends to have sometimes little dots on it, and that tends to be because the, the bridge of the nose is catching a lot of sun, and then we get those little changes in the complexion of the skin, and the, uh, excuse me, in the skin based off of pigmentation, right? So when you look at animals, animals do the same things, okay? When we start looking at different types of bugs and other organics. Now, we'll cover this a little bit later when we come in and we start throwing white highlights in there and really get something to pop. Okay, we'll talk about that when we start moving into lighting. But for right now, I need you guys to come back to this and think about texture variance. Okay, this is the direction we're going into. If you understand texture variance, you understand how to apply them correctly onto different objects with form, and you end up having these really beautiful 
little detailed drawings, but you have to get to a point to where you have a really solid understanding, okay, of what's happening in here. By the way, most of, I gotta give credit to where this is. Uh, this work, most of this stuff is coming from Peter Hahn's class, okay? And the reason why I'm pulling it up right now and talking about it is because when it comes to the world of the basic drawing, he's one of the only people who I think have really nailed it down right when it comes to understanding shape and form and detail. It's really that simple. You don't have to go out and look at, you know, spend 500 hours drawing still lifes to understand anything about texture. Texture's in front of you. You get to create it, okay? So, and the, and the funny thing is, it's not just Peter Hahn, but he's the one that's bringing this stuff up from the masters, okay? If you go back and look, and you go look at Andrew Loomis, and there's a bunch of other artists that are out there, and if you go look at good old-fashioned drawing books that came from the, the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, they talk about this stuff. So what happened? Well, how come artists like, like Vilpu and um, Peter Hahn and a bunch of other artists are out there, how come they're talking about this stuff? Why has it been lost in the world of education? And there's an answer for that. And the answer for that is during parts of the art movements of the 60s and the 70s, when there was a lot of fine art movement, part of fine artists didn't care anymore about the traditional old rules of understanding, the, what I call the pockets of learning, the pockets where you had to master the rules of draftsmanship. Inside draftsmanship, you had form, you had shape, you had the ability to rotate things and draw through shapes and rotate them at opposite angles. And then you got into texture and then you get into lighting. And then after lighting, you have to understand uh, the, the, the uh, amplitude of light that's coming down, which gives you the intensity of light and shows the shadows and the time of day. And then you have to understand how to replicate that, which is rendering. And that's just all under draftsmanship. Then after that, you get to designing then you get to composition, then you get to color and color theory. You see all these important pockets. These are part of your progression as an artist and things you have to understand to be good at what you do. And if you skip these things, you're gonna suck. And what happened is that a lot of the fine artists threw all that stuff out the window because they were too busy looking at Picasso going like, oh, I'm just gonna go into my blue period. and I'm gonna take blue and do all kinds of funky, funky paintings, right? What they didn't realize is that Pablo Picasso was trained as a classical artist. And by the time he was 12 years old, he was able to fully render the figure. And he had a full understanding of anatomy, shape, and form. Then he was able to go with anatomy, shape, and form, and light, and value, and color. And then he was able to go out and do what he did. And to me, there's a huge difference there. You have to have, it's like being a writer. I can just go out and write something and say, oh, I'm a writer now. Not really, not unless you really understand a lot about form and structure and analysis and plots and story points and how to construct your writing. That's the importance of being a good writer. So when I go back and if I start to look up some of these old books, if you look, I, there's a bunch of old books from Andrew Loomis that talks about drawing and technique, right? He's talking about this. What, what were we doing last week? We were doing this. I was showing you ways to make form. And then he's going in and then he's putting linear detail to indicate shape and form and value. By the way, Remember I told you that tree arms look like elbows? What does that look like right there? Elbow. Looks like an elbow. Look at that. It looks like a bicep wrapping around, twisted around part of a, of, a, of a tree arm, right? So now we start getting into patterns. Okay, I'm going to write down some patterns for you that I would like you to do. Okay, I'm going to write down, for example, I'd like you to do patterns of nature. I'd like you to think about man-made patterns. I'd like you to think about patterns on reptiles. And I want you to go in and start making these little texture blocks, okay? So if I go through and start pulling up a bunch of old stuff from these old guys back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s that were doing a lot of drawing, you're going to find everything that we're talking about and, and people like Vilpu and, and, and just a lot, even our instructors here, Joe Weatherly, okay, lots of artists. We're all going back to the same things. You have to understand the difference of patterns. And what are the patterns that make up objects? There are, there are open patterns. There are bushy patterns. There are roof patterns. There are cement patterns. There are patterns for things that are in shadow. It all changes, okay? So part of our next phase here and what we're going to do is not only are you going to do the texture swatches themselves, but then I'm going to have you go and we're going to put the textures into a series of gradients, okay? This is what Peter Hahn does in his class, and he's totally nailed it. I didn't really catch on to this until I was working in animation, 
and I had to start texturing. I had a ground texture versus a house texture versus a roof texture. And then a lot of times I had to go in and I had to paint those textures in Photoshop to give art direction notes for our productions for the 3D modelers or, or renderers or lighters to understand what services were supposed to be. So can you see the importance? If you could create a page like this, you could translate this information over into digital painting. It is not wasted. This information locks into your little brain and your noggin, and you always have an understanding of not only textures, but how to create gradients and textures. That's huge, because then you can take this and you can apply this to any of the other focal areas that we have. Digital painting, figure drawing, storyboarding, you name it. And especially if you're a 3D guy, having the ability to be able to take a, a model and then you can skin the model and be able to take that skin and be able to paint over it and create a texture like this is huge. Even if you get into more complex software like Sub Substance Painter, where you're going over and you're painting textures onto a model in 3D, you have to have an understanding of how textures are created and how they're stacked. And remember I talked about the high point and the low point and really getting very grainy textures or what I call um, nature-driven textures that have like rust and, 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 and something that's aged or old or water that's like, you know, cracked into something and created lots of variant spots and, and decay, okay? Those come from natural nature textures that we can, you know, you can go around and look for. So look at this page here. There's another example another student was doing there, right? Here's some other ones here, okay? For me, part of being a good teacher, what I try to do is I have to look at the things that I learned in the industry. I have to bring those back, give them to students, and then I need to look at other artists that I know that are out there that are doing the same things and applying that into their classrooms as well. Okay, and Peter Hahn is one of those guys. They're just, you know, really getting people to think about all these things. And, and then again, I could go back. I have a bunch of books on Andrew Loomis, and I can open up these books on Andrew Loomis, and he's sitting in there and he's talking about the same thing. Okay, he's talking about understanding these principles. So, first you're going to do a page of the squat of the swatches. I want you to think about, let's go back here. Okay, I want you to think about what other swatches. You know, think about texture variants like that. Think about cracked textures. Um, think about textures of carpet. Think about textures of brick and stone. I'll write down some categories for you, okay? Because we're going to have man-made, we'll have animals, I'll have reptiles. Okay, and then I want you to make little little swatches. I want you to fill uh, 11 by 17 page with tons of swatches. In fact, I think you could easily get 15 swatches in there just to start. And then we're going to take those swatches and then we're going to put them into this. We're going to put them into gradient form. So you have an understanding of how the swatches are adjusting from dark to light. Once you do that, then you can take this and guess what? Then you get to go back. Oops, wrong file. Then you get to go back, and then you get to apply it into drawings. And you get to apply it to fish, and to bugs, and to plants, and to leaves, and to still lifes, and other things that you might see, seashells, okay? All this type of good stuff. And once you get into this, it really opens up a whole new world of drawing where it's not just looking at base plants, and, oops, and waterfalls, and just everything you can think of, cactus, you can start applying it to props, okay? Everything that you're drawing and designing needs to be thought of in this manner. You have to get to this point where you can get in here. And then, once you have the understanding of the textures and texture variants and surfaces, then we'll get into light. Why is that important? That's an important because when light hits carpet, you're going to get a different read than light hitting your shiny little red envelopes right there that carry your artwork in, right? Okay, because then we're talking about surface content and the way a surface texture or content reflects light and there are differences, okay? So, you know, that's a huge part of the drawing, uh, the next level of drawing, okay? All right, let's go through some of these. I mean, you should look at that stuff and be like, man, I want to draw like that. I want to get to that point, and we will. Okay, that's coming up really soon, but before we get there, we have to focus some time onto the basics of understanding all this good stuff here. Okay? Look at these drawings here. 
It's beautiful. Look at the texture variance in there. Look at the difference between the top. Look at the bottom. Look at the bushes right here. Look at the leaves. That's the type of stuff you should be filling in your sketchbooks. You should be going around looking for all these different plants, looking for all these different leaves, okay? How does that incorporate? How do you put that into a world? Artists get paid to do that stuff, especially in 3D. 3D doesn't do all that for us. We have to be able to go in there and tell it that we want this type of tree or understand what is the difference between a maple tree and the difference between uh, an old rooted tree in Africa that has a different type of leaf, okay? We have to be able to translate that as artists for our viewers, okay? All right, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to end part of this demo right here. And uh, class is about done. All right, thank you guys.